Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. I am pleased to welcome to the radio program today Kai Bird for a conversation on nuclear weapons, the threat of so-called tactical nuclear weapons, and also a conversation on the history of nuclear weapons. Kai Bird won the Pulitzer Prize in 2006 for a book that he co-authored called American Prometheus, The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer. Robert Oppenheimer has been labeled as, quote unquote, the father of the atomic bomb. Kai Bird is also a member of the editorial board with The Nation magazine, where he has an editorial called Not Even Nuclear War Will Stop the Fighting in Ukraine. He is a historian, a journalist, and also executive director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography. Kai Bird, a very good morning to you, sir. Good morning to you, Mitch. It's a pleasure to be with you. What prompted you to write this editorial for The Nation magazine, again called Not Even Nuclear War Will Stop the Fighting in Ukraine? Well, uh, the editor at The Nation, Don Guttenplan, asked me to do it after we had a conversation about what's going on in the Ukraine. And I'm sure that it, his invitation was prompted by Putin's recent statement where he gave, gave a sort of veiled threat that he might someday use one of these weapons. And that has uh, generated a lot of speculation about uh, what would happen if a tactical, you know, a battle, so-called battlefield weapon was used in the Ukraine. And so I sat down and began thinking about it. And, um, you know, it, it comes straight out of my work on as a biographer on Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb. And, uh, you know, he, he always, he understood from the very beginning that uh, these are weapons that cannot be used on a battlefield. Uh, and I quote him at one point saying in a speech, just three months after Hiroshima, uh, in a speech that he gave in Philadelphia in 1945, the pattern of the use of atomic weapons was set at Hiroshima. The Hiroshima bomb, he pointed out, was used, quote, against an essentially defeated enemy. It is a weapon for aggressors, and the elements of surprise and terror are as intrinsic to it as are the fissionable nuclei. So what he was saying was that, you know, the, however small the, the weapon is designed, an atomic bomb needs a large target. There is no military target for a tactical nuclear weapon. Even a one kiloton uh, nuclear weapon used on the battlefield in, in the Ukraine would have a, a burn radius of nearly half a mile. And, uh, you know, there are no targets that large uh, that are, strictly speaking, military. So it's, it's insane. And thinking about the size of impact, Today, what we call tactical nuclear weapons, these are supposed to be smaller nuclear weapons than the ones that the United States and the Soviet Union were developing in the Cold War that could completely wipe out a city. Now we have what's called, quote unquote, tactical nuclear weapons. I, I remember when I was a Capitol Hill reporter covering a lot of the push for developing so-called bunker busters that, that the United States was pushing in, in the previous decade. Maybe we'll even talk about those as well. But compare for me um, the atomic bomb that was dropped on both Hiroshima and Nagasaki to these so-called tactical nuclear weapons that theoretically could be used today. Right. Well, the Hiroshima bomb was about 15 kilotons, um, the equivalent of 15,000 tons of TNT. And, uh, you know, they've designed these tactical, so-called tactical weapons that could be as small as one kiloton. Um, but actually, the U.S. arsenal of tactical weapons, we probably have around 200 of these. And uh, many of them are like the size of a Hiroshima bomb. And of course, during the Cold War, as you mentioned, the, the United States and, and the Soviet Union designed uh, hydrogen bombs that were, you know, 100 kilotons. Uh, 
they would you know take out all of new york city and more um so these are are as oppenheimer argued they're not battlefield weapons they are weapons only of terror they're psychological and that's of course what putin is sort of banking on i think when he in veiled threats um, talks about using these weapons uh he he wants to change the psychology of the war narrative in in the ukraine and force the ukrainian government in in kiev to surrender or at least have a ceasefire and leave the russians in occupation of whole portions of eastern ukraine and I don't know the way the war, war, war is going now it, you know this is the the it, it's the ukrainians are fighting back resisting they are the defenders against the war of aggression um and they have momentum on their side and so that's the danger you know we're looking at putin being pushed into the corner and he may well use these weapons uh, or at least demonstrate one to try to change the psychology of the whole narrative and, and you know to terrorize Kiev but I don't think it'll work and I worry I worry very much that uh we're getting into sort of an August 1914 scenario during which is how World War One started where all the parties on either side sort of miscalculated the intentions of their adversary um and they stumbled into a war that no one wanted and no one expected and it was an accidental war and we could do the same thing here in the ukraine we and things could get out of hand if putin uses a tactical weapon on uh, a so-called military target i i hope that the united states does not respond we should never initiate another nuclear war uh instead the ukrainians will probably be outraged at the use of such a weapon and they will double down and the americans will probably double down and send even more conventional weapons uh anyway i hope we don't get into a, an exchange of nuclear weapons because that could actually escalate rather rapidly into a devastating exchange uh in europe and who knows maybe on continental america it's just it's a nightmare scenario what are your thoughts and how the united states has responded to this veiled threat well president biden has taken the long expected and traditional um response of, of uh ambiguity he's you know not saying exactly what he would do and this is part of our military doctrine where we have always we americans have always refused to pledge no first use we won't even do that uh you know the notion is that these weapons uh should be they're part of our arsenal and they their use is deterrence and deterrence is only good if the enemy doesn't know what you're going to do <laughs> that's the thought but i i fear just the opposite i fear you know as i just mentioned the an august 1914 scenario where um one party does something out of desperation and the other party responds in kind and we stumble into a war that no one really wanted uh so i think instead of ambiguity the biden administration should make it very clear that we will not respond in kind to the use of a tactical weapon and uh that we will respond with instead with even more severe economic embargoes and conventional arms to the ukrainians to defend themselves and uh we will make sure that this russians are the russian state becomes a pariah to the rest of the world we could indict putin at you know i mean we should 
make all these threats and make them very clear today before the, anything gets escalated any further. But we should pledge that we're not going to respond in kind because that's the real danger, an accidental war. You think those would be more effective then? Again, as you pointed out, the whole idea up to now in the doctrine has been deterrence and what would keep Putin from using a tactical nuclear weapon would be for the United States not to use one. Or if he did use one, then the United States could use one as well. Well, if we get go down that road, I fear, you know, we will end up being pushing ourselves into a corner and we'll feel compelled to respond to his use of a tactical weapon with one of our own. And I think that's in, insanity. Instead, we should make it very clear to him that we think that these weapons are not battlefield weapons and that they cannot change the course of the war. And therefore, if he uses one, we will simply double down on our conventional arms deliveries to the Ukrainians. We will indict him as a war criminal. We will close down the Ru Russian, all Russian trade. We will go to the Chinese and, and uh, the Indians and say, you cannot you know, deal with this man. He's a madman. Uh, we'll completely isolate him. We'll make all those threats, and perhaps that would be a deterrent. But I don't think a threatening in in advance and threatening to use a tactical weapon if he does is going to deter him from doing this. It's a psychological, you know, it's again, as Oppenheimer said, these are weapons of terror. They're not battlefield weapons. Let's talk about Robert Oppenheimer. When he was working on developing the atomic bomb with the Manhattan Project, did were they also thinking about how to produce smaller nuclear weapons that potentially could be used? I mean, obviously they did use the one, the two in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but was this an issue in his time? No, it was not. Um, and, uh, you know, they were simply trying to create the first such weapon and Oppenheimer's motivation was very much that he believed that, that the Germans were uh, winning the race to create atomic bombs. Um, he had studied physics in Germany himself as a young man and he was friends with Werner Heisenberg who was presumed to be the German physicist who was leading the German bomb project. So he knew perfectly well that Heisenberg and his colleagues were capable of uh, understanding the potential of, uh, uh, of an atomic weapon and how to build it. And he thought that they had started before the Americans and so that they were ahead in the race. And his, you know, he was a man of the left. He, he feared fascism and he feared that the German physicists might actually give the atomic bomb to Hitler and that he would, you know, win the war with it. So he was desperate to build this thing. Um, interestingly enough, at the end of 1943, the last day of 1943, uh, Niels Bohr, the famous uh, physicist of quantum physics, uh, from Denmark, arrived in, a, in Los Alamos on a plane. And he gets off the plane, and the first thing he says to Oppenheimer is, Robert, is it big enough? <laughs> and what Niels Bohr meant was, is it big enough to make sure that we never fight such a war again, that it will end all, you know, the possibility of total warfare as we they were experiencing in World War II. He thought of it as a weapon, you know, that would make it impossible to fight such a war again because it was so large and devastating. And, and uh, Oppenheimer was actually intrigued by that argument. And towards the end of, in the spring of 1945, when they knew they were very close to being able to test the weapon at the Trinity site, 
which happened in July. Uh, at that moment, you know, they could see from the newspaper headlines, the war in Europe was virtually over. Hitler was being defeated. And the physicists, the younger physicists at Los Alamos actually held a meeting uh, in one of the auditoriums to discuss why were they rushing to build this weapon when they now knew that the Germans were defeated. And they didn't think that the Japanese had a bomb program. And so what was the point of all this? And Oppenheimer got up and used Niels Bohr's argument that, no, we have to continue. We have to demonstrate this weapon in this war because otherwise humanity will not understand the Armageddon-like nature of the weapon, and the next war would be fought with, you know, to the surprise of everyone, with nuclear weapons. So Robert Oppenheimer wanted his men to understand that it was important to at least test this weapon in, in you know, at, in this war. And uh, he was perfectly willing to use it on Japan. Um, Anyway, he, he then, to come back to your question about tactical weapons, after World War II, <clears throat> Oppenheimer became very worried about a, a nuclear arms race and the military's natural desire to build bigger and bigger weapons. Um, and some of his colleagues, like Edward Teller, were anxious to build a hydrogen bomb, which Oppenheimer thought was totally useless and unnecessary an a sort of a, a, just an atomic weapon was large enough <laughs> um and so he began to make the argument well you know actually we should be thinking in washington he'd go to the policymakers in washington and say you know maybe we should be thinking about smaller weapons that could actually be used on the battlefield so he actually uh, bought into the notion that maybe these could be become battlefield weapons. But I think this was an argument he advanced only because of his fear of a hundred kiloton hydrogen bomb and, uh, you know, the madness of building a weapon that could take out New York City and half of New Jersey in one blow. Um, and of course, this is why he was uh, put on trial in a kangaroo court in 1954, because he was leading the opposition to building more. Um, he, he opposed the building of the hydrogen bomb. And for this reason, his political enemies in Washington decided to bring this guy down and question his patriotism and, and uh launched this sort of secret trial of him in 1954. This is Letters in Politics, and we are in conversation with Kai Bird. Kai Bird won the Pulitzer Prize in 2006 for the book that he co-authored, American Prometheus, The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer. Kai Bird is also an editorial member with The Nation magazine, where he has an editorial called Not Even Nuclear War Will Stop the Fighting in Ukraine. So so it's it's with the movement towards a hydrogen bomb that has Robert Oppenheimer, I guess, have a change of heart towards this. It wasn't in the aftermath of the atomic bombing of, of Japan. Did, did he have a reaction to what happened in Japan? Japan? Oh, yes. You know, he, <clears throat> he, he was a very complicated, sensitive soul. And as I, said you know he wanted to he worked very hard to build this weapon in only two and a half years because he feared that hitler would get it first but on the eve of the japanese bombings you know one day he was walking to work with his secretary at the time and uh she overheard him muttering to himself and and she got closer and leaned in and said robert what are you saying and he says those poor little people those poor little people and she said what do you mean and she, he explained you know the the bomb if it was going to be dropped on japan was going to hit cities 
and the victims were going to be mostly women and children. He understood that, and it troubled him. On the other hand, that same week, he met with some of the bombardiers who were going to be on the planes dropping the bombs, and he instructed them exactly, you know, at what altitude the weapon should be exploded. And he knew where they were going to be dropped. And he knew that it was going to be dropped on a, on a city or two. And he instructed them, you know, aim at the middle of the city. <laughs> he knew exactly uh, what was necessary if you wanted to demonstrate the power of this weapon. Um, anyway, when he actually read the news of what had happened in Hiroshima, this plunged him into a deep depression. We know this from letters that his wife, Kitty, wrote to friends saying she feared for Oppenheimer's life, she, that he was so down. Um, and, you know, he, he essentially spent the next few years trying to find a way to convince the politicians in Washington to control this weapon and not to rely upon it as a military weapon. He was very sensitive to the, the dangers of what he had himself created. You said he was a man of the left. Tell me about that. Oh, he was, you know, um, like many university professors and intellectuals in the 1930s, he was... Um, horrified by the depression and the toll it had taken on on most Americans and he was sympathetic to he was a professor at Berkeley um, and he was sympathetic to the Communist Party's efforts to desegregate public pools for instance <laughs> he was uh, sympathetic to uh, the cause of the Republican, the, the, the Spanish Republic and the Spanish Civil War that started in 1936. Well, what does sympathetic mean in, in these cases? Well, he gave money. Um, every year he gave about three to four hundred dollars a year to various Communist Party causes like buying an ambulance to ship to the Spanish Republic or uh, organizing uh, campaigns to desegregate institutions like public pools in the Berkeley, San Francisco area. Um, he There's a great debate about whether he actually joined the Communist Party or not, or was just a sort of fellow traveler. Um, and this, of course, is what partly was focused on during his the kangaroo court of the 1954 trial. But we, my co-author and I, Marty Sherwin, who will ask died last year at the age of 84 um we we struggled really hard to figure out what where the evidence led on his party membership and we concluded that he was not the kind of guy who was ever going to submit himself to party discipline and that he never actually there's no party card <laughs> there he didn't appear on any communist party rosters uh, he attended Communist Party meetings. He knew some of his closest friends were members of the party. Indeed, his wife, Kitty, had once been a, a card-carrying member. His brother was a member of the party. Um, uh, but we think he never actually joined. But he was a man of the left. He, uh, And in a sort of typical sense, a man of the left of, from the 1930s. And of course, he... he he, he, his political views evolved, um, but he was certainly, uh, you know, he was he was an intellectual. But when he's attending these meetings, these are these are in the nineteen thirties. Yes, when he's showing active some kind of involvement with the Communist Party, not not early nineteen forties, not the start of World War One. Uh, no, I think by the start of by the start of World War Two. I mean, so World was, War Two, yeah. Yeah, he was uh, more and more con concerned with trying to, you know, he wanted to join the army at one point when uh, he wanted to fight. Um, but 
you know, he was a man in his 30s at that point, and uh, he was, by 1939, he was well aware that that the uh, that building an atomic weapon of some sort was a a, a real possibility. And uh, so when General Leslie Groves came out to Berkeley looking for to recruit someone to be the scientific director of this project, uh, Oppie really wanted that. That's what people called him, Oppie. <laughs> It's closest friends. Uh, Oppie really wanted to do this. He wanted to, he had great ambitions and he under, he thought he was the right guy to do it. In fact, he was. Yeah. Yeah. What well, he thought he was fighting fascist. Is that why? Yes. Yeah. Why, why did the government see him as the guy to lead this? And why do you say he was the guy? The, the right guy. Well, it's it's very curious, you know. General Groves, who who was in charge of the Manhattan Project, um, starting in in about 1942, uh, they were complete opposites. He was, you know, sort of a gruff, um, gruff, masculine, um, no nonsense general. Uh, who had fairly conservative political views. Um, but he was trying to wrap his head around quantum physics <laughs> and figure out how to build this weapon. Um, and he his job was to recruit scientists. And uh, when he met Oppenheimer, really just by chance in Berkeley, uh, he he understood that this was a physicist who actually could speak English <laughs> and could explain in plain language uh, the what was necessary. And Oppenheimer had a, a notion of how to do it. Um, and he told Groves, you know, it's not a it's not a matter of physics. We know the physics. It's an engineering problem. And uh, you need to, instead of having laboratories spread all over the country, you need to bring everyone who you want working on this project together in one place. And he suggested, uh, why don't you put them in New Mexico uh, and in an isolated small town surrounded by barbed wire so that you would have absolute security and you can control who goes in and goes out but inside the barbed wire um, there would you know these scientists would be able to freely discuss the problems they faced and figure out solutions and this would be the fastest way to so general groves who had uh, a real concern about keeping everything secret the security of the operation thought this was a brilliant notion and uh he he saw that Oppenheimer also was extremely ambitious, very smart. And as I said, you know, he was a that rare kind of physicist who also loved French poetry and Hemingway novels and and you know he he could appreciate literature and he could explain things to someone like Groves in plain English. And he was charismatic in an odd way. So even though Oppenheimer at this point in his life, you know, he's like 34 years old and uh, he's never administered more than a dozen graduate students, <laughs> had no administrative skills to speak of, no experience in this vein. Nevertheless, he, to the surprise of everyone, General Groves selected him to be the scientific director, and it turned out to be a brilliant decision because everyone agrees in retrospect that that the project building an atomic bomb in Los Alamos would have taken much longer if anyone else had been in charge because Oppie was the kind of guy who could actually inspire chemists and physicists and engineers to come together and solve problems. And uh, and he was an inspiration and he got everyone to work very hard 
and to produce this in in a record time, two and a half years. There is a moment, and I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but but a moment that is well remembered of him quoting the Bhagavad Gita when he saw the test of the atomic right. bomb. What what what's that? What's the actual story of that? <laughs> well, the New York Times reported that Oppenheimer, upon seeing the results of the Trinity test, sort of mumbled to himself this line from the Gita, uh, I am death, destroyer of worlds. Well, <clears throat> actually, what happened was he saw the, <laughs> the explosion. He was with his brother, Frank. Um, they, they were lying flat on the desert floor. Um, they looked up, they saw the, they, they were looking at it through uh, dark, uh, dark pieces of glass. And uh, he said to Frank, it worked. <laughs> but Oppenheimer had a, uh, a sense of drama. And later, when talking to the New York Times reporter who had been seconded to um, report on this, um he came up with that line and uh you know he had a flair for drama he was sort of an actor <laughs> but but made up afterwards it was he made that up afterwards yeah absolutely but it, it that line has become you know uh his signature line about talking about the weapon and uh and actually, it's an interesting line because it, it is appropriate, but it, many um, Sanskrit scholars actually think that the correct translation of that line should be not, I am death, destroyer of worlds, but from the Gita, if you understand the context of it, it, is, it should be, I am time, destroyer of worlds, <laughs> which fits more with uh, the sort of religious uh, context of the Gita, but in any case, it w it was a good line. <laughs> it worked <laughs> and meaningful, even if he didn't say it immediately after the testing. Right. He he still right. he meant it. When, he when meant he it. Yes. Use it. Yeah, interesting. He he also made great contributions to our understanding of the universe, including black holes. I guess these are things that over. I guess his development of the atomic bomb and his role in that overshadowed these has overshadowed somewhat these other things. Did, did he come to regret that? I think he did. Um, but he was, you know, he was a polymath. As I said, he loved French poetry and literature. And, and uh, in his physics work, you know, he, he, in Germany, when he studied quantum physics for the first time with Max Born at the university in Göttingen, uh, you know, he, he was brilliant, um, and he could write a, 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 a physics paper very quickly and um, made real contributions to the science, but he didn't have the patience to sit with one idea any very long. He was so quick and smart that, you know, he would capture the the notion of the discovery and then he'd move on to some other issue. So in 1939, he wrote a paper, a very short paper, about 15 pages with one of his grad students. And uh, he just predicted on the basis of theory and the mathematics uh, that black holes must exist. Now, no one had ever even heard of black holes. <laughs> uh, but he posited, well, you know, if this is the way uh, quantum works in the universe at large, then at some point there must be black holes. We can't see them. I can't prove that they exist. But here's the mathematics. Here's the theoretical physics. And they must exist. And then he moved on from it. He didn't do any more work on black holes ever. <laughs> but it wasn't until, you know, the night, late 1960s that we had the X-ray telescopes powerful enough to be able to 
actually find physical evidence of black holes. So he was, you know, brilliant. He should have, you know, gotten a Nobel Prize for his work on black hole theory, but um, it it never happened. And then World War II came along, and he famously said, you know, physics ended. No work on physics was done during World War II. It was there were no new discoveries. It was all using quantum physics to simply do the engineering that uh, resulted in creating the atomic bomb. Uh, applying and never, what was already known. Yeah, it was already known by 1939. Um, and that's why there was a race, because it was known. The question is, how do you apply it? How do you engineer exactly. it to make it happen? Yeah, right. The Germans knew it. The British scientists knew it. Uh, even Japanese scientists who had studied quantum physics understood that this was... You know, if you could have, if you could have fission, um, then you could theoretically create a, a bomb. Um, so then it became a large engineering problem. Again, we are in conversation with Kai Bird. Kai Bird won the Pulitzer Prize in 2006 for the book that he co-authored, American Prometheus, The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer. He is a member of the nation's editorial board, which is in the Nation magazine, where he has an editorial called Not Even Nuclear War Will Stop the Fighting in Ukraine. Also worth noting, the book American Prometheus will is being made and has been made and will, will be shown next year as a major motion uh, film, which is exciting, and congratulations on that. Can you, you, you referenced earlier what would happen to Robert Oppenheimer after World War II and, and what you call a kangaroo trial against him. Can, can you tell me more about what happened after World War II and when did the fallout, no pun intended, when did the, <laughs> yeah, it really wasn't, but when, when did things start to get difficult between him and the government? Well, it's a tragic story. He, you know, Robert Oppenheimer in 1945, 46, 47, he, he was a national celebrity. Um, he was probably the most famous American scientist, aside from Alfred Einstein. His image was on the cover of Time and Life, and, you know, he was known as the father of the atomic bomb and um, <clears throat> celebrated for his smarts. And, and uh, as I said, he was extremely charismatic and photogenic and uh, he became the director of the Institute for Advanced Studies <clears throat> in Princeton, where he was actually Alfred Einstein's boss, <laughs> nominally. Uh, and he became chairman of the Atomic uh, Energy Commission at the time in the late 40s. And he used that position and his position at the, at the Institute for Advanced Studies and his celebrity as a a famous physicist to try to educate the public about the dangers of atomic weapons. And as I mentioned, he opposed the development of the bomb, the uh, hydrogen bomb in uh, the late 40s and early 50s. And that gave him new, that, that created political enemies because the Air Force and the Army were vying to put, in fact, more money into the development of larger and bigger atomic weapons. And Oppenheimer, you know, well, famously in, in October of 1945, he ha got a meeting with President Harry Truman. And he went into the Oval Office, determined to try to pitch to the president the dangers of these weapons and the need to establish international controls so that no one would go down the road of an atomic arms race. And uh, he's got halfway through his little pitch to Truman and Truman interrupted and said, well, Dr. Oppenheimer, when do you think the Russians are going to be able to get a bomb? And Oppenheimer was sort of a little stunned. He said, well, he hesitated. He said, I'm not quite sure. And Truman said, well, I know, never. <laughs> Truman thought that the Russians were incapable of developing an, an, an atomic bomb. And Oppenheimer knew at that moment that Truman had no understanding of what was going on. 
and and he in in his uh so startled at truman's response he responded himself by saying well mr president you don't understand we have blood on our hands <laughs> and this of course was exactly the wrong thing to tell harry truman who you know ostensibly it had to make the decision to use those two atomic bombs on japanese cities and uh he quickly ended the meeting and later told uh, one of his aides uh, you know i don't want to ever see that crybaby scientist again um so api had a tendency to you know for dramatization and a tendency to insult people above him in positions of power who were he thought ignorant and uh anyway this is all leading up to why he was put on trial he he did this repeatedly to um people in washington who he thought were were ignorant and didn't understand the dangers of these weapons or didn't understand quantum physics and uh so he created many enemies one of which was lewis straws who dwight eisenhower when he became president appointed as head of the atomic energy commission and uh straws got it into was insulted by oppenheimer at one point they had bad personal chemistry and straws got it into his head that oppie was a danger to the nuclear security establishment that maybe he was a spy because of his left-wing politics and so he orchestrated a security hearing to determine whether oppie oppenheimer should have his uh security clearance stripped of him as a danger and there was a trial that took place in april of 1954 in washington uh it was in camera in secret um and they eventually decided that well oppenheimer was probably uh an american patriot but he was nevertheless a security risk and they stripped him of his security clearance and it was a very humiliating experience for oppie and then they leaked the entire proceedings to the new york times and so there were headlines splashed across the the country announcing that the father of the atomic bomb had been stripped of his security clearance as a security risk and you know the implication was that he was a, maybe a spy and or at, at least a security risk uh and this is of course at the height of mccarthyism 1954 and so he became you know uh going from he went from becoming from being one of america's leading public intellectuals to becoming a pariah universities disinvited him from speeches that they had invited him to give he could no longer give the government advice about nuclear weapons and uh it, it you know it destroyed his life in many ways Th this as the united states both the united states and the soviet union are developing more and bigger nuclear weapons and this happened you know during a, the 1950s when dwight eisenhower was relying on nukes as sort of a cheap defense <laughs> yeah. uh and again we got into exactly what oppenheimer feared a nuclear arms race where we built thousands tens of thousands of these weapons on both sides and indeed we encountered a we lived through a the cuban missile crisis in 1962 which brought us to the very brink of a nuclear war and one that could have accidentally happened as we now know in retrospect Robert Oppenheimer would die in 1967, so he's he's alive um, in 1962 with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Did he did he ever speak about that or or write about that? You know, he did not speak about it. Uh, you know, again, he was no longer allowed a public platform, uh, and. <clears throat> He, he did not, you know, he lived through the missile crisis. I'm sure he was personally horrified by how close we came. And, but he, you know, we didn't even realize at the time, Kennedy, President Kennedy didn't realize that the 
um, at the height of the crisis that the Russians had submarines armed with nuclear tip torpedoes, tactical weapons. <laughs> and uh, at one point, one of these submarines was being hunted down by U.S. destroyers with depth charges, and they were trying to get it to surface, part of the blockade of, the, of Cuba at the time. And the captain of this submarine actually gave the order to release one of these torpedoes. And uh, this this story actually comes from my colleague, Marty Sherwin, whose last book we uh, published just a year before he died called Gambling with Armageddon. He discovered this, wrote, wrote extensively about this story. Anyway, this Russian captain gave the order to release one of these torpedoes, which you know, would have destroyed a fleet of American destroyers uh, on, in, uh, off the coast of Cuba and probably initiated an exchange of nuclear weapons. It's just horrendous. But fortunately, a, as it happened, just by pure chance, by pure luck, a high-ranking apparatchik, a member of the Communist Party, uh, was on that submarine and was able to counterman the order and say, no, no, you can't do that. Um, and that's how close we came to a nuclear war in Cuba in October of 1962. Well, Oppenheimer wasn't aware of this story, but he was aware of the dangers. Um, and he had spent, you know, his life after Hiroshima trying to warn the country about this. So here we are again on the brink of nuclear war in the Ukraine, of all places. It's... it's um, Human folly, what can I say? Did your work on this book, American Prometheus, The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer, inform and shape your thoughts about nuclear weapons today? Oh, absolutely, yes. Um, you know, it's, it's a very, it, it's a story for our time. Um, you know, we've gotten used to living with the bomb. And uh, if you read American Prometheus, and I, I hope many more people read this book after Christopher Nolan's movie next summer comes out, um, I think it's going to be terrific. And he explores many of these issues. And, and the movie is heavily based on the book, and much of the dialogue comes out of the book. And, uh, and it's, it's a, a, a reminder that we should never learn to live with the bomb <laughs> it's we've become too complacent uh in this nuclear age and the story is not over and if we um accidentally get into a, a nuclear exchange it could as president biden used the word the other day it could lead to armageddon and uh and unnecessarily i would argue Kai Bird won the Pulitzer Prize in 2006 for the book that he co-authored, American Prometheus, The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer. I, I believe the movie's called just simply Oppenheimer when, when it comes right. out next year. Uh, Kai Bird is also a member of the editorial board of The Nation magazine, where he has an editorial called Not Even Nuclear War Will Stop the Fighting in Ukraine. He's also executive director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography. Kai Bird, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you. Thank you for having me, Mitch. It was uh, it was fun talking to you.